So my name is Naomi. I work for Alveol. I'm the head of marketing. And today I have the pleasure to welcome uh, for this discussion, Brianna Wheeler from Bram USA. Uh, and we're going to be talking about the role of biodiversity in commercial real estate, more specifically what it means for Bram and Bram USA. So as probably all of, all of you guys know, uh, Bram was established by Bri in the 1990 and is one of the le leading certification system in uh, uh, for sustainability sustainable building globally, sorry about that. It does assess uh, new construction also as refurbishment based on environmental, uh, social, and also economic sustainability criteria. And it aims to promote not only best practice in construction and development, but also in the goal of minimizing environmental impact and also uh, enhancing occupant well-being, which is a very nice or like, which aligns very well with what we do at Alveol. Uh, and today I have the pleasure to welcome uh, Brianna Wheeler. So Brianna is, a, is leading the operations for Bree US. Um, she's also a member of the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment, a chartered environmentalist within the, with the Society sorry, of, for the Environment, a member of the International Society of Sustainability Professional, ISSP, and also Aline Green Associates. So Brianna, welcome. And I hope I did not forget anything in your bio because it's quite extensive. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, no, really happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, I do think that our partnerships or like our collaborations um, is from a few moons ago. I think I was uh, re-watching one of the webinars that uh, we gave, I think it was like two years ago with, with you guys. So such a pleasure to have you back again and discuss biodiversity because it's a, it's a hot topic, especially as we are coming in climate week. So um, today agenda, so we're gonna deep dive into Briam, trying to understand really the certification, the standard, the criteria, the component, all of it. And more specifically, we're gonna deep dive in the role uh, or in the, the place of biodiversity in, in within Briam. I'm gonna discuss a few success stories that we share in common, Alveol and Briam. We're gonna look into the future. And finally, we're gonna leave some questions uh, for the end for the Q&A. So this session overall should take about 30 minutes. Um, if you have any question, meanwhile, please feel free to ask them in the chat. Uh, we have some folks from LVL. We're gonna try to either answer them right away or uh, keep them for the end and remind us that we, uh, you guys have some question. Beautiful. Um, before we get this started, um, for those of new, for those of you guys who are not familiar or quite new with Alveol, so we are uh, the largest scale urban beekeeping uh, company globally. So we uh, we have our pollinator on 2,500 buildings across Canada, U.S., Belgium, U.K., France, uh, Netherlands, and also Germany. We do specialize in commercial real estate, so we work with all the global real estate companies that you see below here and probably many more. Our programs really focus on tenant engagement and well-being, very aligning with Briam once again. Um, and um, currently our product or like our company is evolving into a new platform which aims to gather biodiversity and nature data for portfolio and also properties to allow them to track and assess biodiversity score over time, identifying nature risk and opportunity. So very aligned with what we're talking today. Um, not here to promo all of that, but if you have any further questions about what we're currently working on in the SaaS platform that this is going to become, feel free to send me an email right after. But all of that to, to be said, I'm going to leave the floor to Brianna so she can talk to us uh, about Brianna. Just, uh, just uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Noemi. So, uh, and thanks everybody for joining. Um, really excited to talk about uh, biodiversity today. I think it's one of these topics that sometimes gets sidelined by carbon, right, in the bigger picture. But nature has such a huge role to play in the carbon story, as well as the consideration for how our solutions support. So. Um, so a little bit about Briam. So we were the first, uh, what became known as green building certification programs in the world. We launched in 1990 and our organization, uh, BRE is a building re science research organization over a hundred years old. And in the late 1980s, when, um, sustainability became uh, a term, it was very natural for our organization to sit down and say, okay, well, what does that mean for buildings? Briam was the result of that. And effectively what it was is defining sustainability as being about um, minimizing environmental impact, protecting occupant health and well-being, and ensuring that the asset was financially viable and created value. 
to us, no building is worth building if it's not about people. Why would we waste the materials and the impacts, right? Um, but also it is about the bigger picture over the longer term about how that building um, uh, produces that value uh, in the time. So sustainability is, is really a holistic term and that's where Bram kind of comes from. So uh, we're headquartered in the UK and we have operational centers here in the US, in China and in Ireland for our European business. Um, and effectively, um, you know, Briam kind of spread around the world in part because um, we are a science-based standard. We're an independent organization. Um, we're not a consensus-driven standard. Um, we don't have committees that come up with thoughts and ideas about um, and thinking, you know, bringing in those experts. We have experts in-house that take science and basically shape Briam. Uh, so a great example of that is uh, uh, of that science is that carbon emissions have been the basis of how we've awarded credits in our programs right from the beginning. And that's because science told us that carbon um, is how you measure impact on climate change. So uh, that's kind of how we're a science driven standard. Um, and today, uh, you know, we are probably um, one of the biggest in the world. I think, you know, certainly having 30 some odd years to go with that uh, has helped. Um, but we're in over 89 countries. I think that number is now at 102 um, with that. Um, and we've issued over 600,000 certificates. So it's pretty extensive. Um, and we work in every space in the world. So you can see from the map, yes, the, your eyes are not deceived. That is Antarctica at the bottom. We do have a BRIAM certified asset. But really, it's about how BRIAM can take science and really understand the impacts. Um, we have a program called BRIAM Bespoke that does that. Uh, anyway, so it's it's really, um, you know, that science basis that's that's helped us out. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is what differentiates you guys from all the other certification, the science space. Um, yeah, absolutely. And while science drives it, you know, we put out drafts and public consultation of our of our standards mm -hmm. so that we, you know, get feedback on it. But ultimately, science really does. <laughs> I describe it as science delivers the answer that we need, not necessarily the answer we want, right? Mm -hmm. Like sometimes it's inconvenient or it feels expensive or impossible. It, nothing's impossible, right? But but it's it's the it's the answer that we need. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, so we've got Brian programs for all stages of the building life cycle. So as Noemi mentioned, you know we have our new construction program that's ground up development. We have a refurbishment and fit out program, which is essentially in US language is renovations and tenant improvements, right? Um, but in use is uh, all for existing buildings. Um, and that's really one where we see a huge, um, a huge impact uh, ability. You know, we're looking at the existing built environment. Um, it's gonna be here uh, through to the 2050s when we need to be, um, you know, a net zero carbon economy. Um, and there's a huge aspect of, um, you know, how are we going to deal with all these buildings? So we're really excited about in use, but we look at this as a whole life cycle and whether buildings have um, been developed with Briam in mind through our new construction program, um, there is an on-ramp on for all existing buildings into that. Um, we also have a program called Bram Infrastructure that looks at those bigger projects um, that's used around the world, which is exciting. And then our Bram Communities program, uh, which is uh, on a larger scale, not so much cities. I wouldn't call it like you certify a city, but it can be master planning for, for bigger communities and that. So Amazing. lots of opportunity in there uh, for it. I love that on a talk uh, with you earlier, I think it was last week, you mentioned about new construction versus built already environment and why would we build new when we can improve what currently exists. And I love that you guys are looking at that in very holistic ways and um, also better. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, carbon is the big, you know, mm -hmm. elephant in that room, right? Well, maybe not even elephant because at Climate Week, New York City, like we're talking nothing but carbon. Um, but it is definitely about thinking about a building's life cycle, right? Um, not only do we have to, you know, um, create and manufacture the materials, get them to site and build the building, we then have to operate it for a determined period of time and we have to figure out what to do with it at the end, right? So, um, you know, even, even when we talk about uh, you know, new construction. When, when we think about life cycle, we should. We're also thinking about deconstruction. What does that look mm -hmm. like? So, you know, and you start to change buildings. Um, even in that phase, you know, thinking about buildings as a cost, right? If you're just doing demo, that costs something, and that's you know that affects the bottom line. But what if we think about it as value? Uh, what do we think about you know materials as um, or buildings as materials bank? When those when those materials have value, it's really important. 
Um, and there's historical aspects too. So yeah, the, the greenest building could be the building we've already built. I want to say could. <laughs> it isn't always. <laughs> and, you know, like there's usability and, you know, there's adaptive reuse. But um, we basically, we look to at every phase of that, minimizing that environmental um, impact and then also promoting that that occupant health and well-being um, and the longer term. Can I uh, jump in and say that if I understand this very properly, so you know, building owners or portfolio that have existing building that are kind of enhancing their space could also, in a nutshell, have points for BRIAM or qualify for BRIAM, although they're not building a new construction. It's just like basically enhancing what they currently have. Yeah. So, so for building owners who are going undergoing renovations at any scale, that's what our refurbishment and fit out program is for. So it can do everything from whole building renovations. So literally going, you know, taking off the cladding and like gutting the building all the way down to smaller scale, you know, core systems, local systems, that kind of thing. Briam in use though is, is what we're seeing it being used for is basically understanding whether or not the, the design intent of those re renovations have actually been met. So a lot of our clients use Briam in use to baseline to understand what it is uh, that the existing building is performing and then looking at what they want in the end, right? And mm -hmm. it could be a lot of different things. Sometimes it's the score, sometimes it's the rating. I mean, that's part of the system. But a lot of times it can be just about aligning, you know, the BRIAM standards um, uh, to their corporate values and saying, actually, you know, these five, 10 things really matter to us. And we're gonna use BRIAM to say, this is the performance outcome we want. And using that uh -huh. to drive the design brief for the renovation. And it really also encourages a look at something much bigger than just, um, you know, just a replacement, right? Like say you have an equipment that's failing or it's coming yeah. to the end of its life, right? It's about saying, actually, what more can we do? How can we drive business value through this? Maybe address a number of challenges that we're facing, mm -hmm. but with this solution. And then another question I have as I'm, you know, working with property managers at times or whatsoever. So when and within the process is Briam kind of coming in at the beginning or more towards, you know, like when do you guys get in? Well, yeah, I, it, it, the, the biggest question, I mean, most of the time it's too, it's at the later end, right? Design has already gone through and, mm -hmm. you know, any professional in this, in this industry who's on this call will know that like they've had the panicked calls like yeah design's done but we really care about sustainability and we need to do something more and it's like oh so the best time of course is at the beginning when you're in yeah. conceptual design like what do we want to achieve out of this and working through and sustainability being part of that um definition but um you know it at any point Briam can be brought in but the problem the challenge is the later you get in the process the more um the fewer opportunities there are to change the outcome. Um, we offer um, in our new construction and in our refurbishment and fit out programs, we offer um, two certificates. We offer a design certificate that we call interim because okay. design is the promises you've made. Uh, but the final certificate is the as build. So those are the promises that have been kept. And essentially, um, a, a, a construction project can just go for the final uh, result, meaning that there was no involvement in the design. Um, and, you know, for my clients, I describe that as the you get what you get and you don't get upset kind of certification, because at that point, all the decisions have been made, right? The shovels are going in the ground. There's no really opportunity for change unless there's, you know, without a lot of cost and so on. Mm -hmm. But it's really interesting at that phase to really think about um, and for you know, many folks is to think, you know, if I, if those companies already have design standards, they have sustainability standards, they should see in every project, does it really bear out through the project if you don't have a specific sustainability goal? So it's, it's a great opportunity. It's a learning opportunity to figure out how real, how strong your design standards really are. <laughs> Amazing. Um, let's move forward so we can finally deep dive into biodiversity. But before we get in here, I I want you to talk about the, the component, which will touch biodiversity in some in some ways. So yeah, sure. tell me a, a more about that. Right. right. So we have nine categories um, and mm -hmm. these categories really reflect, I think, Briam's holistic view on the things that you know, really matter in buildings. And when we're talking about, you know, what, what Brianne measures, we focus on the things that have, you know, the biggest impacts. What are those 
aspects, right? There's a billion different things that you can measure. Um, anybody who's seen any kind of comprehensive dashboard has seen something like that, right? But we distill it down into the, the key things that really drive that, that impact. So we've got the environmental categories. So energy, read their carbon transport water. Um, we've got the resources category. This is um, in our in-use program, is we call it resources. In new construction and RFO, it's still split in between uh, materials and waste. Um, but it's effectively about minimizing those environmental impacts. Um, our, uh, and we're going to talk about our land use and ecology category, but I think it's important to note that these categories, you know, calling them out as a category themselves is already a signpost to say, these things matter on a mm -hmm. big level, right? Like, the, you know, land use and ecology isn't tucked away into a corner, like it's part of general environmental impact, right? Like there's, yeah. there's a space for it. So we've also got our health and well-being category. So that brings in the people element, all about how buildings enable healthy occupants. Um, and then we have our resilience category, which I'm really proud of. Uh, we were the first rating system in the world to bring resilience in as a full-fledged category. Um, mm -hmm. And within that, we have uh, physical risk, which actually we've always covered. Uh, and then when we launched this category, we expanded that to include transition risk and social risk. And for us, that resilience piece is all about not just um, uh, mitigation as such, you know, mitigation really for climate change and other impacts sits mm -hmm. in other categories, but this is really about adaptation and what this is. And, you know, so resilience for us is a really big part of this. You know, we're very much looking at the changing future and saying, okay, there's a lot of different things here that are happening. Climate change is part of that, but none of these things are in isolation, right? Yeah. Like you could draw lines between each of these categories. We know you know, that resilience is gonna be part of the land use and ecology picture. We know that the same with pollution, like there's a whole range of things here. Even if, even in these categories, there's a lot of connection and, um, uh, you know, interoperability, I think from a topic perspective uh, that goes with it. So this is all about the holistic view. And I think the really important thing for us is that there, any decision that's made about sustainability in a building and its performance and the actions taken out of understanding it will have other impacts, sometimes unintended consequences. So our holistic approach is very much about ensuring we don't have tunnel vision on solutions, i.e. carbon, right? We could be very focused on a carbon solution that has an unintended impact, like on nature and biodiversity, um, but also realizing that business value is driven through solutions that solve multiple challenges. If you have something that's very narrowly focused on solving a very specific challenge, you have limited business value. So Briam is really about encouraging a more holistic view of thinking about how building performance and different aspects around operations really drives a whole variety of, of co-benefits uh, forward. I like that. It's not like you're bringing it as a very, again, holistic, I think is the word of the day, but it's like, it's not a tunnel vision. It's like looking at all those impacts you can have to yeah. increase building performance. Wonderful. Um, maybe a bit about the ratings. Uh, you guys have six, a, a scale of six, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, exactly. And tell us more about that a little bit. Yeah, so this is very much about a performance scale. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Briam's philosophy has been that certification and our ratings are about transparency of risk and opportunity. This mm -hmm. is not just about the best assets. Obviously, Briam Outstanding and certainly excellent represent a very high level of performance. And, you know, we high five all of those building and asset owners because, you know, it truly is, um, you know, uh, a, an achievement. Uh, to be at that scale but mm -hmm. we also recognize that you know that there are decisions that are made and business decisions made about performance not every building is going to be a high performer so the goal is really to provide an opportunity for that transparency so we expect that 75 percent of buildings um, in any given country including the us should be able to achieve a bram rating but as you go up that rating, you know, it gets more and more stringent. So Bram Outstanding represents the top 1% of buildings globally. It is incredibly stringent. It is hard to achieve. And that is by design. So, you know, it's, it's something that, um, you know, recognizes that high performance, but gives those buildings or those projects space 
to reflect the risks and opportunities from that. So in our new construction program, that may be you know, um, reflective of the limited sustainability features that were brought into the building. It has some value, but that doesn't mean that it's not valuable to a particular buyer or investor. But this is the transparency that's needed to say, okay, what's there? So um, I will mention actually, so this performance scale with the six is for our in-use program, um, our new construction and RFO program only have five. But this is especially important for existing buildings because we have such a long tail of yeah. buildings and their performance. And this is all about moving these buildings along, right? Helping them do better. And you know, while we celebrate the really high performers, for me, the really big win are the folks who take their assets from not being able to certify them to even getting acceptable or pass, right? Because there's a big win there. It's a big leap to get them there. And there are there are you know environmental impacts reduced. There are health and well-being goals achieved, right? There's a lot to say on that. So um, you know that's how we think about it: is how do we um, how do we support our owners, and how do we with the uh, you know while using a science-based standard, right, um, to help them achieve their goals, but also being very transparent about the results of the business decisions that are made. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing all of this. Yeah. And maybe balance, like as you mentioned here, the balance between flexibility and also rigor and credibility. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, again, the answer that you get, not necessarily the one that you want, right? So, um, there's a lot of flexibility in our program. So, um, we have no prerequisites in our program. Um, uh, that's a big part of it. So, it's all about um, our asset owners um, pursuing the things that matter to them right again mm -hmm. reflecting their choices their risks their opportunities um and it also reduces barriers right so for for asset owners particularly with our in-use program um they can pretty much meet the building we make the building where it is um yeah. whatever the outcome of that so there's no investment required no cost just to like meet some particular standard that we say all projects need to do but the way that we balance all that flexibility and um uh you know, kind of option selection mm -hmm. is two ways. So the first is that each of those categories that you saw previously are weighted and they are weighted to encourage focusing on the areas of greatest impact. And that's a really important part because it's not to say, um, uh, you know, there's not equal outcomes or damage from certain things. So that weighting is really important. It also is a great signal to say, if you're looking to maximize your impact, reduce your, you know, emissions, that kind of thing, there are ways, um, it's a priority list, right? What are the things that you're gonna do that is going to mm -hmm. result in the biggest sustainability impact reductions yeah. or whatnot? Um, so that's a good one. The other thing that we do is the minimum standard. So if you think about a prerequisite as a floor, right? It sets the minimum that everybody has to achieve before they start engaging. For us, the minimum standard is more like a ceiling. It's a cap on the rate and it's linked in our program specifically to the ratings that can be achieved. So our upper ratings just aren't achievable without doing a broader approach to sustainable, um, uh, sustainable performance, regardless of how many credits are, um, are brought in. So we yes, have... go on. No, 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 go, go ahead. I wanted to bring a question that we had from the audience, which is interesting and a nice segue towards uh towards uh, biodiversity and nature. Yeah, um, sure. Um, we well, have, yeah, well, just, just to say on that, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a broader approach and it's all about thinking about that building's, um, uh, you know, kind of, it's about nudging, not forcing. And I think that's a really important, again, going back to what this is, this is about transparency. Mm -hmm. Business yeah. decisions have impacts. What, that's what we're doing here. Amazing. We have an interesting question, which I think is a nice segue towards our theme for today, which is nature, biodiversity in within Briam. And quite related to Alveol is like, how do we factor into Briam certification? And we... <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay. I knew this was going to come up because obviously uh, we're talking about bees specifically. So um, I think we we have it maybe on the next slide. So, so Briam yeah. is, um, there's two kind of ways that we do this and our new construction and RFO program, obviously we're looking at, you know, the impacts of, um, and particularly new construction of greenfield development and the impact on biodiversity, but effectively, and in use, we've already got an existing building, right? But effectively what we're doing is 
you know, we look at understanding the potential ecological value on site. Um, for a new construction, it's what that is, how do you protect it through the development and, and as you go on. For mm -hmm. in-use, it's very much about what do we get and how are we going to enhance it? How can we make it more? Um, and that kind of next step is really about how do you manage biodiversity over the long, the long run? So bees are great because that's, you know, they're a pollinator, it's a species, um, you know, a, a key species for protection. We don't call out bees specifically, but what we do talk about is how does nature and flora and fauna specifically, native and other, um, how does that play into the ecological value on site, right? How does that support uh, you know, the, the, the local biodiversity. And so bees obviously have a huge role to play in that um, simply because of their pollinating, um, you know, uh, support. So there's a lot, I think there, we don't call them out specifically, but they definitely factor in in some way. Yeah, absolutely. I think I've seen in your, in your criteria, uh, raising awareness on ecological features. There's providing habitat corridors for local, local native species and also contributing to restoration and growth of biodiversity. Our team at Alveol has that map specifically for Briam. So if you want to know exactly what, you know, how much point you can get or like what categories we fit in as Alveol or urban bee beekeeping program in within Briam, I will uh, generously share that one pager with you guys. So we have everything lined up in there. Um, but also I think, you know, urban beekeeping program as we do them at Alveol have to do a lot with uh, tenant uh, engagement and also wellness. So. Um, you know, I'm here in Vancouver, there's a conference here for Climate Week, and I was discussing with a few folks that we work with, and some of those programs are not necessarily just for, you know, pollination and so on and so forth, but they're also helping tenants feeling more engaged in their workplace. And now as we're speaking about return to work, uh, you know, I think this is becoming a big topic in, um, yeah, just the, the, the relaxation or even like getting closer to nature is like what we aim to do here. And I think is what we do really well at Alveol, which kind of fits in also really well with uh, the wellness that we were speaking uh, just before that. Um, yeah. Go maybe higher up again and bring biodiversity in within Briam. Um, can you tell us more about the key uh, criteria in Briam assessment or like just maybe move on a little bit or tell us more about how this suits in really well in the in the criteria and program? Yeah, I think, um, you know, for, for well, fo let's focus on the in-use program because I think yeah. from an existing buildings, right? Yeah. You, you've got a building that's already there. A lot of times mm -hmm. it's been there a long time, right? Like there, you know, and I'm in New York City this week for climate week. And, you know, you look around and you say, wow, like, you know, it's nothing but concrete jungle. Surely there's no ecological value here at all. And that's not actually true, right? Um, uh, you know, I did have a joke with somebody earlier about, you know, is it ecological value or is it a building pest? Like, that's a whole question. But um, <laughs> but mostly it was about thinking openly about urban environments in particular as not being devoid of ecological value, right? That And that doesn't have to be the case. It might have been the case, but it doesn't have to be. And um, it's an interesting kind of way of thinking about how existing buildings in particular um, think about this issue. So Bram first off encourages understanding and ensuring that you have these areas. And this is a real, I agree with you, like there is a really close intersection with health and wellness. You know, we talk mm -hmm. about, um, you know, in health and well-being about having um, connection to outdoor spaces, right? We know outdoor is one thing enhanced with greenery is going to be a lot different. It's not something we necessarily call it specifically in our health and well-being category, but we know that there's a connection there, right? So so understanding and having just starting with green space is part of that with plantings mm -hmm. with natural, you know, uh, uh, natural plants. I want to be really clear on that. Um, and then there's other benefits too, like depending on how you do it. So whether that's horizontal planting in the ground or you're doing vertical planting on the sides of buildings, um, you know, and shout out to industrial who um, are considering how they how they create that on the walls of their buildings. That's it's a great design feature and it helps cool the building and other things, too. But it can create habitat. And this is where the really big question comes is like, you know, vegetation and all that. Um, it, it, you know, it's great on its own, um, but that doesn't always make it a habitat. Right. So mm -hmm. we really encourage thinking beyond just what am I going to plant that's like low maintenance and not going to use a lot of water to 
cut my costs down, whether it's drought, drought tolerant or not, but also does it support? Does it, you know, is it flowering? So it's very aesthetically pleasing, but also does that support, you know, local uh, fauna as well? Uh, does it support insects, that kind of thing? What does that look like? So Briam really encourages a thinking approach about like, how much more can this performance enhance and, mm -hmm. and go for that? And also then, you know, not just the planted areas, but also fauna too, which of course bees count as, as part of that. But it can be, it can be bats, it can be other kind of insect boxes. Um, and it can also be about how pest management is used, right? Um, uh, or how it's done it at different properties. Um, so, you know, there's a balance to be found between those things, but it's all about encouraging the thoughtfulness of, you know, what do we have here? What's the greenery, you know, the, the plant base to then bring in the fauna um, aspect of that. So that's kind of the enhancement uh, part of it. But this is all part of a longer, well, two things, longer term vision, but also remembering that buildings are not in isolation. They are connected to other places and they are a highway of such, maybe that's a bad metaphor, but here we go. Um, you know, they're a highway, they're a connector between other things. So whether those properties, you know, are, in kind of surrounded by fields, um, you know, we see many properties that have, you know, streams running by them or whatnot. Anyway, they connect to other places. So we talk a lot about biodiversity action plans and aligning that with, you know, not only think about what's on your on your own asset site, but also how does that support a wider um, or a local or regional biodiversity approach? You know, understanding what is the flora and fauna that is native, local, regionally important? How can that be incorporated in and to support um, yeah. the fauna that goes with that? Yeah, so so that's the overarching, there's details and things in there, but but we really, um, you know, we, we really look at this as a value enhancer and nature really, not only as a solution in itself, right? Uh, but But all these other tangents, like these tentacles into other things, how it supports health and well-being, how it supports resilience. And that is a critical thing where I see biodiversity actually being a really big part of the conversation when we start thinking of it as, you know, not just intrinsically valuable, which it is, but also how it can support the resilience of our buildings and our neighborhoods and our communities. Mm -hmm. Do you see uh, with, you know, TNFD kind of coming out with its standards, do you see biodiversity becoming in the later future a category or a criteria in, within RIAM or it's going to remain in within ecology or site resilience or just yeah. under layer or an umbrella between different criteria? Yeah, the TNFD is an interesting thing. And, and you know, I'm really excited about it because I think I think for real estate, it poses a really interesting question. And remembering like all the start, you know, all the task force of which the, another one has been launched this week on social inequality. Very interesting, right? But these are very broad, broad stroke kind of, you know, frameworks, right? And originally they start out about financial implications. So I'll be interested to see how, how this develops over time and how real estate quantifies this. Clearly, we've already, as Briam, set a standard to say that biodiversity matters, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is important, not only for how we develop, but how do we do this in a way that is both sensitive and- Sorry guys for this little Zoom glitch. Sometimes technology is not always on our side. Um, beautiful, so where were we, uh, Brianna? Yes, technical issue for sure. Yeah, I think we were just talking about biodiversity. Um, I think I was saying about how, you know, biodiversity is a resilience, um, uh, you know, feature, right? Like these are things that we can do together. And I think one of the one of the challenges that, you know, we're kind of seeing going forward, we were talking about the TNFD. So, yeah. So, you know, how real estate translates that through will be a really interesting one because, you know, you can you can easily see that for an organization for which real estate is not their primary responsibility, right? Like they are retailers and they're selling items which are fundamentally nature-based, right? So if you're selling clothing or something like that, you know, there's a there's a, a, a clearer line to draw. So I think this will take a little, the TNFD will take a little bit more time to gain traction in real estate, uh, more time than the TCFD. 
but yeah. but uh, just to throw more acronyms around for everybody, um, you know, we should we should provide a glossary really afterwards. Um, but I think I I think there's going to be an important role to play, um, and we certainly um, you know continue to uh, consider our criteria and consider how this balances um, within within the uh, the standard itself and how we continue to signal the value. Uh, that we certainly place on it from our science and our research perspective. And I do think that with all those, you know, frameworks, as you mentioned, and to link with 3M, like the goal here is transparency in, in within, you know, what you're putting forward and, you know, the initiative or, you know, like all the data that you're you're trying to bring to the table. So, all right. Uh, I'm, I want to remain conscious of time, although we had this little glitch. Um, Collaboration with Grez. I don't know if you wanted to say a few things about that here and how you guys have been supporting or supportive of Grez uh, within, within what they're becoming in the role of biodiversity and nature and within, uh, and within this organization and their, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, so we've been working with them a very long time. So they've been around 10 years. We were there right at the very beginning. We were one of their first mm -hmm. partners. and. You know, essentially, for those aren't who aren't totally familiar with Grez, Grez is a an investor-led organization who um, essentially um, sets out the data and requirements, the things that investors um, feel are important, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a really critical piece to understand, right? So it's a reporting at an organizational or entity level, so a fund or company you know, not an asset level certification. It's also a pure benchmark, right? So this is some, you know, we do asset level, you know, individual assets. We don't certify full portfolios and we don't certify organizations, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's all about the, the assets. So for us, this is a very natural thing, right? You take, you know, your multiple 3M certified assets and roll them up into reporting for grads. It's a variation of, of any kind of disclosure uh, that our our building owners will have, and and you know, Gresb is just one of the frameworks that many of our yep. clients disclose to. So um, uh, last year and this year, um, we're continuing the tradition. Uh, we've published an alignment document, which basically shows how um, how Briam uh, assessment criteria or topics really align yep. with Gresb um, for the reporting season. It's not necessarily a um, a, a like for like specifics on like the yeah, data, wonderful. for example. Yeah. But it certainly shows how we, how we consider, how we look at, um, and how Briam data and information can be rolled over to the portfolio level to provide uh, a yeah. reporting mechanism. So yeah, th so this resource is available. It's on our website and, um, we intend to publish one, uh, every year when that, um, when the GRES, uh, assessment standard comes out, uh, in that time. Um, and yeah, we, we look forward to, um, you know, kind of seeing how that evolves. I mean, we've certainly seen how resilience has evolved um, mm -hmm. in the thinking. Uh, and yeah, and, and but we also continue to set, you know, BRAM standards as the science drives it, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Again, it's important to note like what, you know, the basis of how we, how we run our process and develop our standard is all about what the science is telling us. So. It's a good thing. And and I can see actually as ca for carbon, you know, carbon's like the big story at the moment. It's very there's a lot of emphasis on it. But over time, carbon is going to start diminishing in importance in a way yeah. because it will become standard practice. It will become, you know, our grids are greening, that kind of thing. So when you think about all of our weightings and categories, you start to see Briam possibly morphing. And we think about this in decades, right? Not yeah. just to the 2050 line, although you know, wouldn't it be awesome if I just didn't need a job anymore because everybody was doing exactly what they should be? I mean, I would love that, to be honest. We train. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I mean, I think every sustainability professional would be like, you know what, in some ways, I wish we didn't have a job because that would mean that we're doing all these things. But, um, but you know, we think about this in decades. What does that look like? And it'll be interesting to see through GRASP how investors, investors in real estate and real mm -hmm. assets communicate the value that they place on biodiversity through this process. Absolutely, because I mean, I mean, they are responsible. The TNFD report was saying that I think like the built environment is responsible for 30% of the loss of biodiversity in nature. So hopefully there's great solution coming their way uh, yeah. initiative. Also. 
a um, couple of success stories, which I, I will let you share here. So uh, we haven't spoke about that, but um, Briam is definitely accessible through various asset type, which we didn't really talk about. We briefly spoke about industrial, but I'm, I'm guessing like multi-residential is one of them also, like office building. Um, yeah, industrial. Yeah. I I'm going to share a few, uh, a few cases with us here today. Yeah, so, so Briam can be used in pretty much every asset mm -hmm. type. There's a couple of exceptions, uh, but it, it's more dependent on the life cycle phase. So, yeah. for example, data centers. We cover that in our new construction and RFO program, but not in our existing building program currently. So what that means, though, is that with Briam, we see a really wide variety of, um, of use cases. So, yeah, all the examples that you see here. It is both commercial, industrial, residential, hospitality. Um, it's been really exciting to see Briam being used across all those. And of course, as a building science research organization, our goal is to think about the building stock, quote unquote, like the broadest <laughs> bit of that. So when we develop criteria, it's not just saying, okay, it's not just imagining an office in which we work and maybe that's our like lived experience. It's about saying, what about all these other spaces? And that's always our challenge. Like within, you know, would our criteria work in industrial as well as office? What does that look like? What do we mean by workplaces? And in the case of hospitality, right? What do we mean by guest experience? Like these things shift and morph, but we've seen Brianne be really successful. And if you go back to the map really quick, I'm, you know, I'm really pleased here in the U.S., you know, we're now in um, 35 states and there's going to be more this year, um, more to come. We, we publish a, kind of an update uh, from the annual in January, February of every year. So this map will change. Uh, and last year we were really excited because we had over 30 assets certifying Canada, um, which was the I was going to say, I'm seeing a few cities of, uh, of my homeland here. That's great. <laughs> yeah, no, it was it was really good. And I think that that's part of, you know, Briam is a global program. Like we have an adaptation for the U.S. for our in-use program. And mm -hmm. it's mostly about language and standards and things, but it is equivalent. It is comparable, right? So whether Briam is used in the United States or it's used in Canada, the outcomes are um, comparable, predictable, that kind of thing. So it really, for our U.S. asset owners, for our Canadian asset owners, whether they're, whichever country they're in, it's totally fine. Um, and it's the same actually globally too. You can look at a Briam, you know, you can compare Briam performance uh, in these buildings you know, whether these buildings are in Paris or Beijing or Vancouver or New York, like, you know, that's the beauty of, of Briam standards because we speak the language of science, right? Um, that is a universal kind of thing, um, but it is very much, um, uh, for the US, it's very much locally adapted, right? You know, we do take into, into account the local uh, conditions and the US is, you know, we are very different than so many places, but Briam can work. And it does work really well. So what you see here really, you know, I would liken this to, uh, and some for some folks, it may be a surprise when you're looking at certain states there. It's like, really yeah. sustainability? Well, yeah, because sustainability is a business risk and opportunity. That doesn't know borders, right? That's not that's not a state thing, that's not a country thing. It's it's about understanding that risk. And when you look at this map, basically think about the American economy and how it moves. Over 60% yeah. of our certifications in the US are industrial properties because that's where our economy sits. And that's what you're seeing here. And it's growing faster every year. That's great to hear. That's great to hear. Um, reminds me a little bit of, uh, as you guys will have the election very, very shortly. It reminds yes. me of uh, <laughs> Yeah. Beautiful. Um, and maybe a success story is that we share in common. So Alveol, uh, it is the UBS building in London, UK. So Briam, excellent rating. So I don't know if you guys remember, it was the five stars, um, which is excellent uh, in terms of Briam standards. It does have gardens, pollinators, flower. Um, you know, our B program keeps tenant connected uh, with sustainability strategy of the organization, raising uh, local awareness or, you know, awareness on ecology ecological story features and also sustainability initiative so if i wrap this up because i want to stay um, you know uh, careful or mindful about the time here um what would you say is coming forward for briam briam us uh, brianna in the in the coming let's say like you know one three or like 10 years <laughs> to kind of give uh, to kind of give a sense of perspective always in the holistic manners as you discussed earlier <laughs> Yeah, so so for Briam, it's it's 
all about looking at the science and how the data is informing that position, right? So we know, you know, that carbon, the focus on carbon is critical. It is yep. accelerating. Um, and, uh, you know, that is coming in small part through regulation, right? U.S. is very different than Europe. U.S. does not have a top-down approach like we're seeing in Europe through regulation. But nonetheless, um, you know, in the U.S., that really hasn't been a huge driver. What we're seeing is that the investors are all pointing now the same direction for the yeah. most part. Um, uh, and we are seeing finance now pointing in that direction. And that is really a critical piece because, you know, the because we're a federalist um, uh, uh, country, you know, we don't have the top down controls, right? Like we don't have a national building code. We don't have, and as much as some folks are like, oh, please, wouldn't that be great? You know, there's some benefits to the systems that we have. And that's what we've seen is that, you know, we've seen innovation happening in cities who are looking at this. We've seen the rise also of regulation at the city level. So building performance standards and, you know, building performance standards, I think are quite exciting in a way because they are finally putting a price on the transition. And, you know, it's really hard for, you know, for an organization to focus minds when they don't have the financial understanding about what the impacts would be. And building performance standards, however imperfect they are, um, are bringing that to bear. And that's, you know, in some ways it's been quite, quite helpful. So the direction of travel is really clear. Um, the key thing I think for, um, you know, sustainability overall and something that we talk, that I talk a lot about is about our, our need as an org, as a industry to be very clear about value and mm -hmm. quantifying. And that's difficult sometimes, right? Like I said about transition risk, right? If you don't have a dollar number behind it, what is that? How do you do that? But we need to be very clear about communicating business value in all that we do. Mm -hmm. And it's there. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, one of the things that I'm, you know, you know, I, I kind of joke with folks about, you know, the last thing I want to ever hear is somebody say, but it's the right thing to do. Well, gee whiz, if it was the right thing to do and that's what everybody was guiding everybody, we'd be doing it. Right. I don't think people are bad. I just think that, you know, financial decisions, you know, sometimes don't get the outcome, the sustainability outcome. Right. So how do we start communicating value? How do we start thinking about value? 3M is one way to do that, right? We incentivize performance in a particular way. We use, we use science to talk about mitigating risk, sustainability risk, and going on to opportunity. So this is a way of incentivizing and pushing that forward, but we still are going to need a much, um, as an industry, a much clearer value case for those who are not sustainability experts and so on. So we're really working hard to help define that, help communicate it, yeah. and essentially you know, support our industry to make the case uh, for this. Wonderful. We are past our time. So I if ever you have any question coming to your mind, our um, emails are right there in that, that slide. And then we'll be communicating and resharing uh, this recording later today or even tomorrow. So feel free to reach out to Rihanna Wheeler or myself at Alveol. Rihanna, thank you so, so much for joining us today and talking about Briam and also biodiversity and nature and sustainability across uh, commercial real estate. So thank you everyone for joining and talk to you soon. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Take care.